Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's Brendan Bradley here at the University of Canterbury. It's my pleasure to introduce today uh, a friend and colleague, Mishko Kubranovsky, uh, also from the University of Canterbury, to deliver this month's Quake Core seminar. Uh, Mishko uh, will be known to many of you, but for those of you that uh, don't know him, he's the flagship two uh, coordinator, uh, sorry, leader in, in the Quake Core program. Uh, he's also uh, known in New Zealand as the leading authority in earthquake uh, liquefaction research. Uh, in, in particular, uh, notably last year, he was the recipient of the Ralph Peck Award from the ASCE and became only the second person who's not uh, US-based to win that award in the last 21 years. Uh, and he's also the current chair of the technical committee for earthquake geotechnical engineering and associated problems. Uh, so drawing on that wealth of experience, I'm sure we'll enjoy uh, hearing the seminar from Mishko about that uh, research field. Mishko. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to actually not discuss about my research, but about more general issues in engineering evaluation of the perfection problems. And obviously, it has to do something with the research that we are doing here. Uh, the principal target is probably around engineering aspects, but the presentation that I prepared is at high level. So hopefully it is going to provide some uh, more general concepts that uh, people from other disciplines will also uh, appreciate. So I don't think I have to emphasize the importance of liquefaction for New Zealand. Uh, what we saw during the Canterbury earthquakes, the massive effects on the city of Christchurch, and then what we saw in Wellington happening during the Kaikoura earthquake and uh, effects. There was a huge effect on the port of Wellington, which is a, a critical facility for the city. So clearly, uh, liquefaction is a very relevant hazard, and also the exposure and vulnerability to liquefaction is, is very high in New Zealand. So what are the typical effects of uh, liquefaction? Uh, I will show you a few examples. On the top left-hand side here, you have large ground displacement due to lateral spreading, causing the collapse of the uh, upper deck of the uh, elevated highway. Obviously, large ground, horizontal ground displacements in this case is the consequence of liquefaction. You can see differential settlements affecting shallow foundations in the building itself or a six-story building in, in Christchurch, so large vertical displacements. Then uh, we've got cases of uh, large lateral strain. You see a huge crack opening in the ground at the surface due to lateral spreading. There is also a distributed shear strains throughout the depth of the ground, so there is a lot of deformation happening vertically in the deposit. And finally, we can see here the worst case when we have a collapse and a loss of bearing capacity. So the key effects are large ground displacement, horizontal and vertical, lots of deformation in the ground, lots of strains, and potential loss of uh, strength and stability. So why is this happening? Uh, I'll, I'll go and try to illustrate this on a simple case. The discussion is not necessarily very simple. So let's consider a soil element at a given depth z. So the weight of the soil above the element and the water are creating some stresses in the soil. And we care about the effective stresses. Those are the stresses of the contact of soil particles. One important feature is shown here that as you increase that stress in the soil, the strength of the soil is increasing. So the effective stress is critically important. So we can easily calculate these stresses for any given depth. And suppose this is the level of stress acting at that element. So we can identify what is the available strength for the frictional property of the soil. It is pretty straightforward calculation. So this is the initial stress-strain relationship of this soil element before the earthquake strikes. Now, during an earthquake, excess pore water pressures are developing, and this leads to a reduction in the effective stress. In the case of liquefaction, the effective stress is going to drop to zero. 
So we have lost the effect of stress. Meaning now the available strength is very low. So once the soil liquefies, it does not have any capacity to take loads. And that is why large deformation is caused. So the key effect from an engineering viewpoint is dramatic loss in stiffness and loss in strength. And this is why we are seeing all those large movements and collapse of structures. This is the key effect of liquefaction on our engineering properties that we work with. So in this talk, I'm going to cover four important aspects of the engineering uh, assessment. First, I will provide some generic context and what are the key objectives in the assessment. Then we'll focus on the diffraction resistance of soils, obviously a key element in the assessment, and we'll discriminate between different types of soils. Then I will focus on the larger response of the whole deposit and system response effects or interactions within the deposit. And finally, we will remind us that we are discussing the dynamic problem, earthquake engineering. So time is important, how mechanisms and deformation evolve. So I will uh, briefly discuss that topic as well. So let's start with the context and objectives. I'm going to use this very generic chart. Uh, on the horizontal axis is the ground shaking intensity. Uh, in descriptive terms, it's low here, high there. On the vertical axis is the performance or deformation or response, if you like. A large deformation is at the top, so poor performance and small deformation. A little damage is at the base of the scale axis, and we have good performance. So typically, liquefaction works like this. When the earthquake excitation is low, we are getting small response. Not much is happening. The performance is good. Then liquefaction is triggered. Stiffness and strength go down, then rapidly the soil becomes very deformable and deformation increases rapidly. So at this threshold of earthquake loading, we are getting a large increase in the deformation and consequences of liquefaction. So the key feature to remember is that liquefaction may cause abrupt deterioration in performance at the triggering of, of liquefaction at the particular earthquake load. That's important features that we will work with. So now I will change this earthquake intensity with peak ground acceleration, a proxy for the intensity, and we'll continue with the discussion. So now we have an options. Liquefaction can trigger early if the soils are loose or at very high accelerations or earthquake loading if the soils are denser or somewhere in between. So the first objective in the assessment actually should be at what loads liquefaction will be triggered. So more precisely, what we are interested in is at what PGA or earthquake loading there is constant of significant damage. What we care about is not the triggering of liquefaction per se, but what is the consequence and damage. So you want to understand first that. That is objective number one. The objective two is related to what is the consequence of liquefaction? So this is one scenario, one case, when liquefaction has been triggered, but the effects of liquefaction are relatively small. We are getting negligible deformation, so the response is still relatively good. The other case is when the effects of liquefaction are quite severe, so we're getting a lot of displacements, a lot of deformation. So objective number two is to actually quantify the effects of liquefaction in terms of deformation, damage to your structure and to ground. I think that every assessment of liquefaction should address these two objectives to understand when damage is going to start to occur and how big that damage is going to be. What we have to understand in this process is that there are uncertainties, as is the case in uh, seismic engineering. So there is going to be uncertainty with the triggering threshold or damage onset threshold, and there is going to be uncertainty with the consequences of liquefaction. What is important to can I read? One of important things to understand is that in the current procedures, these uncertainties strongly depend on the type of the soil that we consider and on the deposit characteristics. So the uncertainty will be very different for different soils and different types of deposits. So I will emphasize the importance that 
in the assessment, you have to understand what kind of soils and deposits you're dealing with. So let's first discuss the importance of the soil characteristics. These are listed typical liquefiable soils, silts, sands, gravels, and their mixtures from relatively small part particles to larger particles. They are all frictional, so effective stress is really important for their behavior. In the case of silts, they can be either non-plastic or of low plasticity. So in some cases, plasticity is important, at least for silts. So in the simplified assessment, clean sand has been used as a reference material. That is why it was involved. All the procedures we have developed have been developed based on clean sand. So that's your benchmark material, if you like. So what do we do in the assessment? Let's now focus on the simplified assessment. There is a soil profile. For each layer, we are calculating the factor of safety against liquefaction triggering, which is given as a ratio of CRR, which represents the liquefaction resistance or the capacity of the soil, and CSR, is the demand or earthquake load imposed for which we are doing the calculation. So we calculate the factor of safety, and if it is less than one, then the perfection will be triggered. It is pretty straightforward calculation. So let's discuss this CRR that we calculate in this simplified assessment. And first, I'm going to discuss clean sands. This is an empirical chart, which is the basis for the evaluation of CRR for clean sands. You can see a lot of symbols. Each symbol is one case history history uh, from a previous earthquake. The red circles symbols are indicating sites where liquefaction was manifested. The open symbols are sites where liquefaction didn't manifest. And then this line is providing some uh, estimate or a lower bound envelope that we can use to estimate the liquefaction resistance of clean sand. And this is how it works. So here is the line. We perform a CPT in the field. From that, we are going to identify uh, cone tip resistance QC, and we can easily calculate this normalized cone tip resistance QC1 and CS, which a lot of indices, subscripts. Once we know that value, we can read off from the curve what is the liquefaction resistance of clean set or CRR. It's pretty simple in principle and in concept. What's the meaning of QC1 NCS? Well, QC1 NCS is kind of a good proxy for the density of the sand. So if you have low value of QC1 NCS, that is implying that the soil is loose, the sand is loose, and you're going to get relatively low liquefaction resistance. On the other hand, if the soil is dense, then you're going to measure high penetration resistance in the field and the liquefaction resistance is going to be much higher. You can see a huge factor of four. So dense sand is having four times higher liquefaction resistance than loose sand. So density is key parameter that affects liquefaction resistance. And density is the reason why we actually rely on penetration tests. So I will not go further into details. So let's see another important effect of density. So one is like, you need higher amplitude of loading to cause liquefaction when the soil is denser. But once the soil liquefies, there is also a very important difference between dense and loose sand. If the soil is loose, when it liquefies and the effective stress drops to zero, effectively it behaves as fluid, as heavy fluid. And as fluid, it cannot take really any shear stress. So if you apply any earthquake loading or shear stress, you're going to get very large deformation. So the stress strain curve is flat. It's like water, close to water. If the soil is dense, things are quite different, actually. So you have a branch of relatively uh, large strain development, but then there is strain softening, and you're arresting the level of strain that will be developed because dense sand will start dilating. So this is response of dense sand. So dense sand is going to recover some of the effective stress. It is going to recover stiffness and strength. And for that reason, the deformation will be very limited. If you have medium dense sand, you can be somewhere in between. So clearly, the density of soil is affecting the liquefaction resistance, CRR, or the triggering threshold. 
and also the consequences of liquefaction or how much deformation will develop once liquefaction has occurred. So that's the story for clean sand. And for clean sand, this line here is very well defined because we have lots of data. Once you have some mixtures of sand with other soils, like components like silts or gravels, things are much more complicated. So let's consider a mixture of sand and silt. So you have 35% silt. There are three problems with that curve in comparison to the clean sand curve. First, very few data are used to define this curve. So we are not really sure where the curve sits. Second, we are using one simple parameter to characterize complex composition of soils, fine content. We are not discussing how much sand, how much gravel is in that soil. Is any of these uh, fines plastic or not? And they are going to have huge effect on the curve. So our material characterization parameter is not very good. And finally, there is relatively poor understanding what is the relationship between tip resistance measured in that soil and the density of that soil. For clean sand, we have good understanding of this relationship and we know very well how sand behaves at different relative densities. For this kind of complex soils, we are not that sure. So you have three sources of significant uncertainty. So in my conceptual chart, I can plot that loose sand behavior will show this kind of behavior. You have early triggering, significant deformation and consequences, and relatively small uncertainty that gray shaded area. The same apply for denser, small uncertainty, but obviously triggering will happen at very high loads or it won't happen. And even when it happens, the consequences are small. If I have silty soil, I have huge uncertainty in terms of triggering and in terms of consequences of liquefaction based on our current procedures. So this is a fact, and I think this should be acknowledged and incorporated in the assessment because it is a critical information that you want to uh, have uh, taken care of. So let's move now uh, on the wider interaction within the deposit and uh, system response effects. And I'm going to compare two types of deposits here. These are schematic plots with some data uh, from CPT testing on two types of deposits that are encountered in crashers. On the left-hand side are deposits composed of sands, and they are, we call them vertically continuous. So you have sands all the way through in the top 10 meters, and all the materials are liquefiable. These type of deposits are typically along Avon River, for those familiar with crashers. This is another type of deposit, which is highly interbedded. You can see now the green layers are clean sand, the pinkish layers are silt, non-plastic, the gray layers are non-liquefiable soils. So you have highly interbedded uh, deposits of liquefiable and non-liquefiable materials. These are typical for southern crash, south of CBD. And during the earthquakes, there was dramatic difference in the performance between these two types of deposits. For the vertically continuous clean sand deposits, there was massive and widespread liquefaction with very severe damage. In the second case, when you have highly interbedded deposits, quite often not much happened. Actually, in this case, nothing happened. Now, our current simplified procedure has problem with this too, because the simplified procedure is basically going to give you the same result, that both are going to produce some severe effects of liquefaction for the earthquake demand imposed in the February event, 2011. And the reason for that is one important detail in the analysis that we use in the simplified method. In this method, we evaluate the factor of safety against triggering for each layer independently. You don't consider what is happening in any other layer. And then you calculate and superimpose the effects to identify the damage index for the deposit, to quantify the damaging effects of liquefaction for the deposit. So in essence, you're ignoring interactions between the layers during the earthquake shaking and during the evolution of liquefaction. 
So is this interaction important? And there are several types of interaction. We've performed very detailed analysis, and the answer to this is yes, it's very important, actually. It can dramatically change the outcome of the response. So these are, this is summary of those results. And let's consider first this vertically continuous uh, sand deposit. There are several mechanisms that I would like to highlight. So first, in that deposit, liquefaction develops, there is number one, in the critical layer, in the weakest layer. And that layer is quite weak, very loose sand. So this is going to fluidize during the shaking in one, two seconds of shaking, so very quickly. Once this liquefies, there is additional um, disturbance effect because this layer beneath is also developing pore pressures and is supplying water to the layer above. So there is a lot of water coming into the weak fluidized layer. So this becomes really like water, if you like. And then on top of that, you have dissipation of excess pore water pressures and water flow towards the ground surface. That is why we are seeing lots of water and sand ejecta uh, on the surfaces uh, of sites that have liquefied. So in essence, all these layers vertically connect and you're having very damaging discharge of pore pressures and water towards the ground surface. And then we're seeing these huge piles of sand on the ground surface and with large damage. In the case of these highly interbedded deposits, the story is a bit different. Again, this one is a very weak layer, similar to the layer here. However, quite often there is also weak layer at larger depth. So this layer liquefies first. Once this layer liquefies first, it kind of creates a base isolation mechanism. So it reduces the demand accelerations and shear stresses for this part of the deposit. So this is mechanism two. On top of that, because of this high, high stratification of the materials, this soil is often not fully saturated, which increases the resistance. So for that reason, in our sophisticated advanced analysis, we found that that layer quite often did not liquefy. So you are getting now eight meters thick top part of the deposit that hasn't liquefied. And even if you have liquefaction developing at large depth, that may not manifest on the surface. So you're seeing that the interactions within the layers are creating dramatic changes in the outcomes of liquefaction. So clearly we want to take this into account when evaluating liquefaction. Going back to the conceptual chart, let's see how we can present the system response effects. In the simplified analysis, we are having superposition of individual effects of layers and getting this kind of response. However, if you do proper dynamic analysis, you may find that actually layer two, the blue one, will liquefy, and that liquefaction will prevent liquefaction from occurring in the other layers. So as a consequence, the system response effects are going to dramatically reduce the effects of liquefaction. In other scenario, you may find that if you increase the demand quite significantly, at some point, layer two and three may liquefy. And in that case, you're getting that kind of response due to interactions. So clearly this system response is also demand dependent. So we need to incorporate this kind of consideration in our assessment, being that liquefaction problem or engineering evaluation in principle, how the system is going to respond, respond and is it going to produce some governing mechanisms that are going to change the outcome? And finally, a very brief note on the dynamic na nature of the problem, which is often lost when you start using static and equivalent simple methods. You stop thinking about earthquakes and their nature and what's happening with the structure that you're considering. So very brief reference to that. And I'm going to use, again, uh, some part of our study on the system response effects. So this is the vertically continuous sand deposit, and we are going to follow how the response evolves during the shaking from our analysis. So we are having uh, acceleration trace at the base of the model at 10 meters depth, and let's see what is happening throughout the deposit itself. These are the critical layers, so critical zones with lowest liquefaction resistance. And this is indicating how excess pore pressure develops in that deposit. When the red line means this meets this dashed line, the soil liquefies. So you can see that at six seconds, 
rapid buildup of pore pressure is started, and at nine seconds, the soil has liquefied. In three seconds, that layer liquefied. And pretty much similar for this point, which is at a shallower depth, at 2.3 meters depth. This is showing you liquefaction developing there at 10 seconds. Once this part of the soil deposit liquefies, actually the other layers know that something happened during the earthquake. And how did they know? Well, look at what is happening with the pore pressure development in the layer beneath. From six to nine, 10 seconds, there is very rapid increase in the pore pressure. And it seems like, well, this is going to liquefy 12 seconds, but actually it didn't. Once the top part liquefied, then demand is reducing. And as a consequence, you're getting lower increase in pore pressures and that layer didn't liquefy. This is clear effect of the liquefaction in the upper part. Even more, if you look what is happening with the accelerations at the ground surface, this is the trace. Once liquefaction develops here, you're having filtering of high frequencies, and you can see how the response completely changed because of the fluidization of this part of the deposit. So clear effect on the accelerations, on demand, on shear stresses, which is affecting every single layer in the deposit. And if you focus what is happening here above the water table, then you're seeing this blue line is just telling us that because of the high pore pressures here, excess pore pressures, there is water flow towards the surface and that is increasing the excess pore water pressure in the layer above. So you can see interaction, interactions in the dynamic response. You can see interactions through the water flow through the deposit. So this kind of reference to time and sickness of events and mechanism is really important to consider in dynamic assessment. Not always for every project, but developing as a habit to have this tool uh, in the arsenal of tools is, is really extremely useful. And of course, I'm discussing here one of the simplest systems that we are discussing at the moment, but this is an equivalent analysis, seismic effective stress analysis applied to a 10-story building, which is base isolated, on piled foundations in liquefiable soils. And then we are considering what are the effects of ground improvement on the response of the system. I don't know any other alternative means to evaluate response of systems, but this kind of analysis. I'm not suggesting it's simple and easy, but definitely the tools are there and we should gradually move towards using that tool appropriately as a support in our assessment. This is another case of a levy, uh, it's quite high, 10 meters high. Again, ground improvement in this zone has been investigated uh, uh, in terms of what is it eff effectiveness for reduction of uh, deformations due to earthquakes and liquefaction. So the way I see it is the principal role of seismic effective stress analysis or dynamic analysis, if you like, is to improve the understanding of the designer, of the dynamic response of the system, including complex interactions in the system. Sometimes it's very difficult to anticipate what this system is going to do because there are too many elements. Things are rapidly changing over a short period of time. And this analysis is going to provide some insights. It is going to make you think about things that you didn't anticipate before the analysis. Now, those were dynamic analysis. We often use equivalent static analysis, sometimes referred to scenario analysis. So let's consider that kind of analysis. And suppose we are considering liquefaction and lateral spreading problem is affecting a structure and pile foundations. And you're using equivalent static approach to evaluate the response of the piles. And here is schematic plot of how excess pore water pressures develop, let's say, in part of the deposit. So you have rapid buildup of excess pore water pressures in this blue zone in two, three seconds. Then the soil liquefies. And then post-liquefaction, there is still some ground shaking because the earthquake is going to continue. And after the shaking stops, you're having dissipation of pore pressures and the soil is going to recover stresses and go back to stable equilibrium state. If we are performing equivalent static analysis, they really to subdivide this in different domains. So I would perform one analysis upfront when the pore pressures are very low, 
Then we'll perform one analysis during the rapid buildup of core pressures and large cyclic uh, loads. In that case, there are going to be cyclic loads due to oscillation of the superstructure. There are going to be cyclic loads due to ground deformation throughout the depth. And of course, the pile is going to fill both of those. The soil property is going to be reflecting what is happening during this phase of the response. Then there is going to be another analysis in which I will be considering what is happening after liquefaction. You're going to change the properties, you're going to change the loads, etc. So this kind of scenario analysis is quite useful, but you really need to adopt appropriate models that are reflecting the mechanisms for each phase. And you really have to select the appropriate values for the parameters for the soil as well as for the load so that you have realistic models and analysis that are going to give you something. Again, it is perfectly fine to do something like this. But for example, the method that we have developed and proposed for PALS is a result of 15 years of study with heavy analysis of case histories benchmark, shake table test, centrifuge test, lots of analysis, and then you summarize it into something simple. So you really want to do that in a manner that you will confidence that the procedure you're using is, is reflecting the key mechanisms and you're using uh, appropriate properties. And then once you have done that, you can address uncertainties in a reasonably simple and effective way. I think I'm getting close to the end. So I have a couple of slides to go. So based on this simplified chart that I have used, let me illustrate some of the anomalies that we have at the moment. Our current standards quite often identify SLS and ULS as two levels for which we perform design. Now let's consider two cases. These could be uh, different deposits, if you like, and their performance. And in case A, you're having relatively small response for low PGAs, low earthquake loading, until you hit an earthquake loading equivalent to 40 year return period. At that point, we are getting triggering, increasing the response, and then relatively uh, large deformation is obtained for any higher input. Case B is slightly different because you're getting triggering at 400 year return period, and then you are getting similar effect of, of liquefaction. If you do analysis in a discretized manner and you just follow SLS and ULS checks, for SLS, these two actually give you the same answer. No significant effects, good performance. For ULS, no significant difference. Both are giving you large deformation and relatively poor performance. But if you want to buy a house and it's sitting on A or B, you really want to go for B because this one has seven to 10 times higher likelihood that damage is going to occur during your life in that building. So in that sense, clearly one of the principal assessment features of performance-based design is to have a holistic view of the performance covering the whole range of return periods and levels of damage. And this brings me to the concluding marks. So four remarks. Holistic assessment is required in the performance-based approach. And in that, we have to identify the onset and evolution of damage as the earthquake loading increases. And of course, we have to quantify co consequences of liquefaction. Number two, in the assessment, we have to recognize that the uncertainties depend on the type of the soil we are dealing with. We have much smaller uncertainties when we have sands. Once we have mixtures of sands with silts or gravels and some plasticity, then our methods really are not as good as for sands. So you have to account for that higher uncertainty. The third one is that we, there is clear evidence that system uh, interactions, uh, sorry, system response effects and interactions within the deposit or other system, if you like, are critically important in some cases. So you want to identify those kind of mechanisms and effects and quantify them the best you can. And finally, we have to acknowledge that we are dealing with dynamic problem 
And the use of dynamic analysis is, is really a great tool that provides uh, unique insights on the response characteristics and interactions. This is something that is providing feedback to me and to the designer. And you will learn something out of that analysis. You will start thinking about things that you haven't anticipated or given adequate attention before doing the analysis. So that would be my talk. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Mishka. Um, as well as the people here in Christchurch, we have another 40 people uh, online. So uh, happy to take comments or questions at this stage uh, from either of those people, groups of people. Uh, maybe I can start with a quick question then from Mishka. Um, can you give us some additional insights? You mentioned in particular the challenges with the large variation in behaviour and particularly uncertainties around different soil types, both vertical deposition as well as the nature of the materials themselves. Um, can you provide some context where in New Zealand we see some of those challenging deposits in particular and what people in the design community might wish to look out for? Yeah, that's a good question. Because I had actually one slide which was uh, describing. Uh, we didn't, we didn't see that. No, this wasn't this wasn't arranged. But this directly aligns with the Quake Core research, because uh, in Christchurch, one of the bigger projects that we had were was silty soils project. So you have silty soils in these deposits. So we are trying to sample some of those soils, bring to the lab, and and understand how their behavior relates to, to clean samples. Then what happened at the Wellington port, at the Wellington port, there is a mixture of gravel, sand and silt, which is very tricky to evaluate because of the very high percentage of gravel. Actually, we have 50 to 70% gravel and then a little bit of sand and silt, but those two are controlling the behavior of the mixture. So, Reclaimed land is often composed of these uh, more problematic soils. Another problematic soil in New Zealand would be pernicious or volcanic soils, which have additional complexity because they are crushable. The particles themselves are crushable, unlike silica-based materials. So you're getting a completely new set of mechanisms that are evolving. So People apply the current procedures to those kind of soils and they obviously can't work because they are not developed for those. But I would admit that there is absence of any guidance in that regard for, for uh, dealing with those soils. So in the Quake Core research, actually, we are addressing uh, those specific issues. Uh, it's very relevant for New Zealand. Uh, Occasionally you meet clean sands, but most of the time you get very complex composition and depositional environments in New Zealand. Uh, system response effect is a study directly originating from Christchurch and is uh, reflecting uh, some key characteristics of what we are seeing in Christchurch. It is uh, apparent that that kind of problem is apparent throughout New Zealand. And I understand that, uh, that some companies have ensured that uh, they're now kind of routinely considering the system response effects and the, and the relation. And uh, the seismic effective stress analysis is another topic that we are attacking in Quake Core, uh, which is really implementation of different constitutive models and different platforms and providing guidance how to use that analysis. Uh, Recently, we have developed a procedure for 1D analysis of uh, deposits, which is fully automated, so the, the user doesn't need to do much around the preparation of the analysis. In that sense, we are trying to support also the profession in terms of uh, application of that methodology to, to problems. So, yeah, every, everything that I've mentioned is really relevant for New Zealand and is uh, key topic of interest in the research. Another question I have. Um, you gave some holistic sentiments for, let's say, the technical engineering community with respect to treatment of liquefaction hazards. Do you have any particular thoughts on what more can be done in better communicating that to the sort of non-technical portion of society, particularly uh, you drew the example of a building owner looking to buy a house. How do you think we could improve communication to the public at large. 
It's a tricky subject. Uh, I've been involved also with development of some, some of the guidelines for New Zealand. And at that point, you start grappling with these issues of transfer of what we have learned to the profession. And it is having effects immediate and, uh, for the future, as well as on the wider community. It is a, a big challenge, I would say. Um, the best is, I think, if engineers first adopt this kind of methodology and it becomes their routine practice. And then gradually the communication with uh, owners and stakeholders is going to bring the other party at the level where that communication is going to be more meaningful. We are dealing with extremely complex problems. Uh, I believe it, uh, it's an incremental approach and the first step is uh, genuine uh, uh, acceptance of this methodology from the profession and that, that communication will be much easier. Direct communication from mass to the owners is a bit difficult, not impossible, but quite difficult. Uh, Brendan, uh, Misko, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, especially the last part, uh, that holistic consideration that fascinated me as well because of the synergy that it has with the structural engineering implication, uh, I think, uh, in terms of percentage NBS that we use, that is exactly uh, has the same issue where the decision is made for one discrete performance level in that broad spectrum of earthquake probability, and people forget about how it would perform at other level of uh, excitations. Uh, and in in a way that relates to the link between the probabilistic nature of the hazard that we have and the decision making framework, which is still based on one or two uh, discrete level uh, performance, right? So, uh, do you do you agree that actually there is a need to uh, probably change the psyche in terms of the thinking, uh, the decision-making approach uh, uh, that uh, all earthquake engineers uh, have, uh, or, or most earthquake engineers have at the moment, because I have been telling that, uh, you know, for percentage NBS, if you uh, think deeply, like if you have a structure with larger percentage NBS, that does not necessarily mean that it will perform better at moderate or lower level of earthquake. Uh, which many engineers don't realize. And in your chart, in your curve, is there a possibility that uh, case A will trigger earlier, but at a larger level of earthquake, it will have lesser uh, liquefaction than something else which triggers later? Uh, because that is possible in uh, structural assessment at least. So I want to know whether it is possible in geotech uh, assessment, you can have cases which can confuse people. Okay, uh, I will start with the last one. Probably it is difficult and it will be a very unusual situation to have that kind of scenario in geotechnical response of, of soils. On the first one, the holistic approach, for me, that is all about performance-based design. Um, the practical aspect is how actually structures are designed and assessed. And it is discreet, and I understand that part as well, because you have to be practical in, in the profession. Uh, so there are clearly some gaps, and we need to identify best ways of bridging those gaps so that we really reach the performance-based assessment uh, in an uh, effective and practical way. I, I definitely agree with you, Rajesh. This is not a soil liquefaction problem. This is an earthquake engineering issue. And I believe we can improve a lot. And I do know that there are those kind of discussions in the uh, structural field as well. So, yep, yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Misko. Of course. Yeah, uh, yeah I have a two part question. You showed those three solar layers where you showed the evolution of the excess flow pressure. And you mentioned that the liquefaction of the top layer can influence or prevent liquefaction of the bottom layer. So I I knew that it was the other way around, where the lower layer of the pipe and that can reduce the demand on the top layer. But can you just explain a bit more the mechanism? Is that, is that the way to get damp down to the end of the back down to the layer? Yeah. I mean, it's related to the acceleration phase that I was showing at, at the surface. Okay. So the shear stress generated in any layer is based on the acceleration response above that layer. 
So once those accelerations drop, the shear stresses will drop. So because you're accelerating the body above that layer, and once you reduce that load, the shear stress will drop. So the effect of liquefaction, which is reflected in the reduction in accelerations, uh, accelerations is going to be felt throughout the difference, including the layers below. You know, have you run the analysis where you What we were doing was we were trying to make our best estimate for the liquefaction resistance of any given layer and then just run dynamic analysis and then things are switching on or off depending on the relative response between layers. When you change the demand, clearly different parts of the deposits may liquefy. As you increase the, the demand, you're typically getting more liquefaction. In some cases, you're not going to increase the liquefaction from, but it is demand dependent. So in that sense, we were not tweaking anything, but we were trying to, because we worked with uh, 55 deposits, not one or two, and we had uh, two earthquakes, so we had 110 responses. So we were just trying to replicate the best we can with what happened. Ah, okay. I guess I have one question I have for you. So you Mm. Uh, but the construction layering in general mm. will seem to reduce the profit of the scale. Mm. Um, so I wonder if it also becomes um, slightly potentially dangerous in the sense if we move away from the previous situation where we're on buildings and then we are relying on the security of those. Sure, yeah. Uh, definitely what we are presenting here is, is, is valid for the systems that we analyze. And one of the anomalies that we have in our current assessment procedures is generalization of problems and mechanisms. And it is like sand and you apply it to everything else. So not to that extent, but I'm trying to emphasize the issue. So there is a good saying, courses for courses. So in that sense, you really have to think of once you have a structure, what does it mean you're changing the stress field, what kind of new interactions will develop, what the building is going to do to the deposit system, et cetera. So for me, that is really the engineering assessment. And uh, I think developing some uh, types of responses and scenarios is fine, but we really need to support them properly with uh, a good research behind and then understand limitations. So in that sense, I wouldn't say, well, once you have stratified deposit, you've got no problem. That is not the message. The message is things are different in those two types of the deposit and try to understand the differences. Any final questions from people online? Okay, if not, on behalf of everyone, allow me to thank Mishka once again for a great talk. And as always, this uh, will be uploaded to the Quake Core YouTube page uh, for access afterwards. Thanks very much. See ya.